guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part two of the neural system, okay, the nervous system. If you guys haven't had a chance, make sure that you watch part one as well. Uh, if you're new to this channel, I'm, I'll let you know now. The questions that I pick are questions that you as a student, you're most likely to see on an exam, which includes NCLEX, HESI, ATI, midterm, final. So I don't choose random questions. I go over these questions and these questions and concepts that are super important that you definitely need to know as a student. So those are the ones that I choose to cover, okay? If you haven't done so already, please make sure that you like and subscribe below. Make sure you press that notification bell. That button will notify you every time a new video is uploaded. So without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question. A nurse assesses a client who has episodes of autonomic dysreflexia. Which of the following conditions can cause autonomic dysreflexia? One, headache. Two, lumbar spinal cord injury. Three, neurogenic shock. Or four, noxious stimuli. If you're new to this channel, guys, go ahead and just press pause so you can look at the question, your answers, think about it, and just press play when you're ready to continue. So the correct answer, guys, is for noxious stimuli. And when I say noxious stimuli, I mean anything that annoys that patient's body. It could be a wrinkle in the bed. It could be a pinprick, okay? It could be a full bladder. It could be constipation. That's why the, these type of patients, we make sure that we're going to put a urinary catheter in there because we can't afford for them to get a full bladder. We're going to make sure that patient gets lots of fiber, right? We're going to make sure that that patient gets lots of fluids and they're not what? Constipated. Because all of those things can cause autonomic dysreflexia, which by the way, is a medical emergency, all right? That patient's blood pressure gets so high, it goes through the roof, they can possibly stroke out on you. A client with a T1 spinal cord injury arrives at the emergency department with a blood pressure of 82 over 40, pulse 34, dry skin, and flaccid paralysis of the lower extremities. Which of the following conditions would most likely be suspected? One, autonomic dysreflexia. Two, hypervolemia. Three, neurogenic shock. Or four, sepsis. And the correct answer, guys, is neurogenic shock. Look, look at what's happening with the patient. So let's go through um, these clues that they gave us in the question. Blood pressure of 82 over 40. So this patient's hypotensive. Pulse of 34. Their skin is dry. The skin is trying to hold on to the little bit of fluid that it has. And the patient's got flaccid paralysis. This is a CNS issue, guys of the lower extremity. So you're going to suspect neurogenic shock. There, um, no SNS is going on. Remember the sympathetic nervous system? That S in sympathetic nervous system, that S th stands for speed, right? The sympathetic nervous system speeds everything up. It increases the heart rate. It increases the blood pressure, right? It speeds everything up. But in neurogenic shock, the SNS isn't working. So what happens? That pulse goes down. That heart rate goes down, right? And then you see those CNS issues such as the what? Flaccid paralysis. Now let's look at our other choices. One, autonomic dysreflexia. Guess what? Autonomic dysreflexia. I just talked about that. Blood pressure would have been through the roof, okay? That's not what's happening here. Two, hypervolemia. If a patient has hypervolemia, they're going to show signs and symptoms of fluid overload, right? Blood pressure is going to be up, not down. Pulse is going to be up. Why? That heart is trying to push out all that fluid that the body has. That's not what's happening here. And then four, sepsis. Well, if the patient had sepsis, we'd, be, we'd see signs and symptoms of infection. WBCs would be through the roof. And um, this situation doesn't even mention anything like that. So the correct answer is neurogenic shock. An 18-year-old client was hit in the head with a baseball during practice. When discharging him to the care of his mother, the nurse gives which of the following instructions? One, watch him for keyhole pupil for the next 24 hours. Two, 
Expect profuse vomiting for 24 hours after the surgery. Three, wake him up every hour and assess his orientation to person, place, and time. Four, notify the physician immediately if he has a headache. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So the correct answer is three, wake him up every hour and assess his orientation to person, place, and time. Why? This person got hit in the head with a baseball bat. So our first indication that something's severely wrong, such as that patient may be getting increased uh, cranial pressure, right? Or maybe there's not enough oxygen supply that's going to the brain. The first thing that the first manifestation that we'll see in a patient like that is a change in their level of consciousness. That patient will go from being awake, alert, oriented to confused, right? So that's why it's important to wake them up every hour and just make sure there's not a decrease in their level of consciousness. And if there is, that patient needs to get to the hospital immediately. Let's look at our other choices. One, watch him for keyhole pupil the next 24 hours. Um, you'd give that instruction for a patient that had an iridectomy, okay? Two, expect profuse vomiting for 24 hours after the injury. No, you better not expect profuse vomiting. What does profuse vomiting after that type of injury tell you? Increased intracranial pressure. That is bad. You're not going to tell them to expect that. Matter of fact, you tell them if this happens, you need to get them to the hospital right away. Call 911. Four, notify the physician immediately if he has a headache. Why are you going to notify the physician? He got hit in the head with a baseball. He's going to have a headache. That's going to happen. Don't you, when you have a headache and somebody hits you in the head with a baseball or a baseball bat. So that's why number three is the correct answer. You want to be checking that patient's level of consciousness because that is going to be your first indicator or one of your very first indicators that something's wrong with the patient. Next question, which neurotransmitter is responsible for many of the functions of the frontal lobe? One, dopamine, two, GABA, three, histamine, or four, norepinephrine. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer, guys, is dopamine. Um, this is what's responsible for affect, for planning, that type of thinking, right? And those patients that don't have enough dopamine, right? What kind of conditions can they have? Parkinson's, schizophrenia, okay? Two, three, and four, just wrong. And let me tell you guys, very seldom are you gonna get a question that's just straight to the point. This basically was a definition question. It didn't even, um, there was no critical thinking involved. You know it or you don't. So it's very important for you guys to know about dopamine, frontal, no, frontal lobe, affect, planning. And if you don't have enough of it, what kind of conditions that we see most likely? Schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. The nurse is discussing the purpose of an EEG with the family of a client with massive cerebral hemorrhage and loss of consciousness. It would be most accurate for the nurse to tell family members that the test measures which of the following conditions. One, extent of intracranial bleeding. Two, sites of brain injury. Three, activity of the brain. Four, percent of functional brain tissue. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer for this, guys, is activity of the brain. That's what the EEG will tell us, okay? Let's look at our other choices. One, extent of intracranial bleeding, that's a CT scan or an MRI. That'll tell us how bad it is as far as the bleeding is concerned. Two, sites of the brain injury. Again, a CT scan or an MRI can tell us that. And then you have choice four, percent of functional brain tissue. Well, an EEG can tell you that, but not alone, okay? It would have to be um, in conjunction with a CT scan or an MRI, not an EEG alone. So the correct answer for definitely telling you what the activity of the brain is, that's the EEG, okay? Choice number three. 
Next question. A 20 year old client who fell approximately 30 feet is unresponsive and breathless. A cervical spine injury is suspected. How should the first responder open the client's airway for rescue breathing? One, by inserting a nasopharyngeal airway. Two, by inserting an oropharyngeal airway. Three, by performing a jaw thrust maneuver. Four, by performing the head tilt chin lift maneuver. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. All right, guys, so the correct answer is three. You want to do a jaw thrust maneuver. So let's think about this. If we go back to the question, it tells us that the patient fell about 30 feet. That's a pretty bad fall, okay? Whenever you even suspect, you don't have to confirm, you suspect that there's a possibility of a cervical spine injury, what do you want to do? Make sure you mobilize ahead. You do not move it at all. You do not move the neck at all because you don't want to cause further damage. You don't want to be the one to paralyze that patient. So when you do number three, the jaw thrust maneuver, you're able to get their mouth open without what? Having them flex, extend, or rotate the head, right? You're not messing with that cervical spine at all. So um, with the jaw thrust maneuver, you do that and what? You can get air into the patient because in the question it says that they're unresponsive and breathless. So that's what you're gonna do. And all the other choices, guys, you can possibly move that cervical spine and, and um, paralyze that patient. So number three is the best option. All right, guys, we're down to our last question. The nurse is caring for a client with a T5 complete spinal cord injury. Upon assessment, the nurse notes flushed skin, diaphoresis above T5, blood pressure of 162 over 96. The client reports a severe pounding headache. Which of the following nursing interventions would be appropriate for this client? Select all that applies. Now, guys, if you've been following me in my videos, you know how you're supposed to treat select all that applies. You have to treat them as true or false questions. You can't try to group them together and see if it's true that way because that's how your students tend to get them wrong, okay? You're going to go through each choice. If it's true, you keep it. If it's false, you throw it out, all right? So back to the question, which of the following nursing interventions are you going to do for this patient? One, elevate the head of the bed 90 degrees. Absolutely. That's true. Why? Go back to the question and look at that blood pressure. 162 over 96. We need you to get that blood pressure down, right? So you're going to elevate the head of the bed, all right? Two, loosen constrictive clothing. Absolutely, because look at this whole situation. What are we suspecting? Autonomic dysreflexia, which is a medical emergency, right? And what did I tell you just a few questions ago? Anything that, um, any noxious stimuli can cause this. Guess what? This patient should not have any constrictive clothing, anything pressing against their skin, anything tight. So absolutely loosen restrictive clothing. We do not want any kind of tactile stimulation on this patient. Three, use a fan to reduce diaphoresis. Yeah, no, the fan's not going to do anything. Okay. And the patient has that diaphoresis because of what's happening, autonomic dysreflexia. So no, we're not choosing number three. Four, assess, the bla assess for bladder distension and bowel impaction. Absolutely, because we know that a full bladder or that patient being constipated can cause autonomic dysreflexia, okay? That full bladder or all that fecal matter that's hard in um, the GI tract that's pushing against the bladder can cause that irritation and cause autonomic dysreflexia. Absolutely, these are triggers, guys. Remember, any noxious stimuli, any tactile stimuli are triggers for autonomic uh, dysreflexia. Five, administer an antihypertensive medication. Absolutely, this patient's about to stroke out on you. Their blood pressure's through the roof. And number six, place the client in supine position with the legs elevated. No, we are not going to do that. You do that when the patient's going through shock and you're trying to get the blood pressure back up. This patient's blood pressure is too high. We're trying to get it down. 
So we're going to do the opposite. We're putting the head of the bed up, right? We're not elevating the legs. Now, guys, like I said, this was our last question, but there's something I wanted to point out to you as well. If you look at choice number five, it said administer antihypertensive, which is the correct answer. As students, I notice you struggle with um, questions that say administer med if it doesn't say as ordered. Let me make this clear. If you guys haven't watched my, um, I think that's my how to pass NCLEX video, make sure you watch it. But one of the tips I let you know, if that's your choice, you have an order for it. Okay. So when you read a test question, it doesn't have to say as ordered. If you have, um, if you have a medication, it's ordered. Okay. Now what you cannot do is if you see a choice that tells you to do something out of your scope of practice, of course, you're not going to choose that. You can't do that. Okay. But if you see an answer choice of give a medication, which is something that you would do, it is implied that you all have the order for it. It doesn't have to say as ordered. I'm letting you know that for NCLEX because I noticed a lot, a lot of these students tend to struggle with that. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to keep the videos coming. I really appreciate the comments that you guys leave. Um, it's very encouraging. Thank you. If there's any um, subject or concepts you'd like to see me cover, please make sure you leave a comment. Let me know and I'll make sure I cover a video for you. If you have any friends that are in the nursing programs or anyone that you know that has graduated that's studying for NCLEX, please share my videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and press that notification button and I'll see you guys next time.